All right, so airway. So the cognitive objectives um, at the co um, completion of this lesson, the paramedic refresher student will be able to describe the indications, co um, contraindications, advantages, disadvantages, completion, um, and technique of ventilating a patient by a uh, mouth to mouth, mouth to nose, mouth to masks, one person BVM, two person BVM, and three person BVM. Uh, we're also talking about flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation devices. We're also describe indications, contraindications, advantages, disadvantages, complications, and techniques of ventilating a patient with an automatic transport ventilator, or otherwise known as an ATV. Um, compare the ventilation techniques used for an adult patient to those used to a pediatric patient, and define how to ventilate the patients with a stoma, including a mouth stoma, which sounds absolutely disturbing, and also mouth. Um, bag mask to stoma ventilation. Describe the indications um, and techniques required for a CPAP. Describe the indications um, techniques required for PEEP. Describe the special considerations in an airway management and ventilation for a patient with a facial injury. Describe the special considerations in airway management and ventilation for pediatric uh, patients. Describe the assessment uh, to confirm correct placement and um, of the endotracheal tube. Describe the pr process of intubations of the trachea by following methods. Um, oral um, intubation, nasal intubation, multi-lumen airways, and also identify um, indications for cracheotomies. And describe the processes of tracheotomy. Identify various alt alternative airway devices. Uh, describe the processes utilized in patients of various alternative airway devices. Uh, all right, airways. All right, so the most important points to consider in management of airway is going to be rest. Um, is is to remember this: if rest, if they're in respiratory distress, if it is left uncorrected it will lead to respiratory failure once, once they get tired enough. And then once respiratory failure starts to kick in or starts to deteriorate, it will eventually lead into respiratory arrest if not managed adequately and then eventually a respiratory arrest will end in death. Uh, recognizing respiratory insufficiencies. Is their airway open? Can you prevent the, um, um, can you maintain their airway? Is it noisy or do they need, um, need suctioning? And is it, is their airway, um, is their airway threatened or is it most, or what is the most appropriate steps to take to secure it? What does their breath sound like? Um, is it adequate enough? Is their breathing adequate enough? Are they readily assess tidal volume and, and breath sounds? Um, ex, uh, do you need to expose the ch um, expose the chest to check ac accessory muscle usage and um, to look for obvious injuries and also look at their level of consciousness and and, sin and their skin signs? These are all going to be all indicators that the patients are starting to crash on you. Um, so causes of respiratory compromise usually could be caused from obstruction or of, of air movement in either upper or lower respiratory tracts. So the upper airway is going to be usually poor muscle tone, loss of control, or alteration of consciousness. Lower is going to be most common cause is going to be bron bronchoconstriction. Even in small, ch um, even small changes dramatically affects the amount of air movement. Uh, disease processes uh, can affect uh, respirations such as asthma, acute bronchitis, um, chronic bron um, bronchitis, bronchiosis, emphysema, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolisms, ARDS, spontaneous and um, eotrinic uh, pneumothoraxes, core pulmonary, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, and pertussis. Uh, so your mechanical failures are going to consist of chest trauma, drowning, and altered, um, altitude sickness. 
So the disease processes that can affect respirations are going to be your asthma, bronch bronchitis, acute pulmonary edema or uh, APE, cystic fibrosis, pertussis, corpulmonary, uh, congestive heart failure, spontaneous intrinsic pneumothoraxes, acute and chronic bronchitis, uh, emphysema, pulmonary embolisms, pneumonia, ARDS, and RSV. So asthma. This usually affects between 10 to 15 million Americans in the world, about 4 to 5%. Uh, this is roughly about 4 to 5% of the population. Uh, responsible for 40, or sorry, 4,000 to 5,000 deaths per year, common in children and young adults. Pathophysiology is going to be reactive. Um, it's going to be, it's a reactive airway disease that's caused by reversible airway obstruction of the bronchial smooth muscles with hyper secretion of mucus, causing a plugging and, and inflammatory changes to the bronchial walls. Exacerbation caused by alveolar hypoventilation leading to hypoxemia, CO2 retention, air, air trapping. Acute and chronic bronchitis. This is going to be the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. Um, rare in adults under the age of 40. Affects only 10% of the population between 55 and 85. Uh, 5 to 24% uh, mortality rate associated with a patient's hospitalized with COPD exacerbation. Pathophysiology of airway is going to be limited. That is not fully reversible. Uh, patho pathologic changes um, in the number and size of mucus producing glands leads to increased um, leak, increased mucus production. The alveoli are not seriously affected and diffusion remains almost normal. Chronic bronchitis prevent um, patients have a low O2 pressure because of the changes in ventilation, perfusion of, in the lungs, which leads to hypoventilation, hypercarbia, hypercapnia, hypoxemia, and also increase in PaCO2. Excessive mucus trapping bacteria and leads to tissue scarring. Uh, patients have multiple uh, URIs or upper respiratory infections. Scarring um, caused by bronch um, bronchiolitis, um, abnormal dilation of the bronchi. The difference between acute and chronic is bronchitis is acute refers to an episode of exacerbation. Uh, core pulmonary, or otherwise known as pulmonary heart disease, is the um, is the enlargement and failure of the right ventricle due to increased vascular resistance or pulmonary uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, caused by uh, uh, causes originate from the pulmonary circular um, circulation vascular changes due to decrease hypoxy uh, hypoxic ex, um, injury or chemical agents and cr and chronic hypoxic pulmonary va uh, vasoconstriction caused by our ventricles or right ventricles um, to try and move blood against the chronic back pressure. Uh, the right the right side um, of the heart is considered a low pressure pump because it generally does not have to work against the back pressure. So with the um, certain lung diseases like COPD, the blood pressure in the lungs is decreased. Uh, or sorry, the blood vessels in the lungs are decreased and the chronic constriction due to poor alveolar um, ventilation and COPD. So the right ventricle cannot push blood into the lungs effectively and chronic back pressure can cause it to fail. Oh, yeah. So bronchiolitis, this is acute infection diseases of disease of the lower respiratory tract that affects 11 to 40 percent of all children. I'm sorry, 11.4 percent of all children, younger than one and six percent of the children at the ages of one to two, accounts for 4,500 to 90,000 hospitalizations per, or sorry, 4,500 deaths and 90,000 hospitalizations per year. In children two years old, 95% um, have evidence of past infections by RSV. 
So the pathophysiology is going to be the inflammation of the lower airway uh, with increased mucus production, acute narrowing of the airways due to inflammation of bronchioles, tissue, and clogging of the airways by infectious byproducts. Um, you're also going to see fever, tachycardia, and tapnea are present, may present with the same symptoms as the asthma attack, with the exception that the onset um, is slower and the patients will be febrile. RSV is a major cause of, of lower respiratory tract infections, uh, or sorry, um, resp uh, RSV, or otherwise known as the respiratory cent central or sentinel virus. All children have been affected um, by RSV um, by the ages of two or three years of age. Uh, I know for a fact that my daughter's been, she gets it, she's she's only 15 months old and she's had it, I think, three times now. Each infection reduces the immunity um, that lessens over time. So reinf uh, reinfection is possible, uh, may, Patients may end up um, having seven reinfections. Um, se severe infections are increasing by seeing in the elderly patients also. Emphysema is going to be an incidence um, for leading causes of death in the U.S. Rare in adults under the age of 40 affects 10% of the population from the ages of 55 to 85. The mortality rate is usually associated with patients hospitalized with COPD exacerbation. Um, it's going to be between 5 to 24%. The pathophysiology of airflow limitation is not fully reversible. All right, so the pathologic changes in the large and small airways increases the mucus secretion in large um, terminal air sac space called the blebs. Uh, thickening of the endothelial uh, walls impeding gas exchange, a large amount of the alveoli with the air trapping. They have a high caloric uh, requ um, requirements for the working of breathing, increases in pulmonary pressure leading to core pulmonary, Um, exacerbation of the um, COPD are caused by many factors. Um, however, 70% of all exacerbations follow a recent URI or upper uh, respiratory infection. So here's the difference between a healthy set of alveoli and a patient that has COPD. As you see here, the they start to trap air and they start to cut off the ability to use those alveoli. They also lose the ability to um, of um, elasticity inside the alveoli themselves too. And here's the normal alveoli versus what a damaged alveoli uh, would look like for the, um, and then also it has a picture of lost lung tissue. All right, so acute pulmonary edema, or in other words, those APE. This, um, the incidence of this is going to is not going to be a disease itself, but a byproduct of another disease state, um, such as congestive heart failure. The APE creates a situations with um, alveolar shunting due to a fluid in the alveolar space. Perfusion mismatching causes the um, hypoxia, leading to respiratory failure. Uh, the common disorders that affect approximately 700,000 people per year with uh, 50,000 fatalities, 10% die within the first hour of symptoms. Uh, oh, sorry, this is pulmonary embolism. I'm sorry, I didn't read the top part. Um, pulmonary embolisms is going to be responsible for 5% of all sudden deaths. Patho pathophysiology is going to be most often caused by a migration of a thrombus from, uh, from the large veins of the lower extremities into a pulmonary artery. If the blockage is 60% or more, it will lead to hypoxemia, acute pulmonary um, hypertension, systemic um, hypotension, and also shock. Here's a, you know, since here's the pulmonary embolism, this actually just looks like a, um, this, this is actually from a, a nosebleed. But what this dude is, what this is from is actually where they started having difficulty breathing. Uh, associated with the nosebleed, whenever they go and clean out their 
airway, all their bronchus and, and everything else like this, this is what they pull out of the guy's chest. Uh, ARDS. Let me see where I was outside. Oh, I passed up my stopping point. Let me uh, go and see if there's another one coming up. Oh, yeah, we got one coming up. Uh, side 513. We'll stop right there. So we'll go a few more slides to kind of go over the definition of these different disease processes, and then uh, we'll take a quick break. All right, so ARDS. ARDS is not a primary disease, but it's also it's a complication of traumatic injuries or a disease insult. Um, this is going to be a direct injury, maybe a um, thoracic trauma, gastric um, aspiration, toxic gas insulation, or a disease process such as sepsis, pancreatitis, or non-thoracic trauma. Uh, it carries about 40 to 40% 40 mortality rate. Pathophysiology, due to the underlying systems, systemic responses, diseases, injuries, the lungs, um, tissue is affected and becomes stiff. Blood flow is reduced. Platelets um, aggregate um, in the lungs, leading to a microembolize and subsequent um, ischemia. PE um, ensues that the uh, causes more hypoxemia. This leads to respiratory failure. Many patients die secondary to original insults um, caused by the ARDS. Um, spontaneous and um, um, idiotrophic uh, trogenic pneumothoraxes. So uh, incidences. Uh, so this is about affects about 20,000 cases of spontaneous pneumothoraxes um, occur per year. Uh, this is usually happens in the tall, thin males being a typical victim, has the um, basis in re, um, reality. Males have six to one risks, um, and um, a tall, thin stature contributes to those risks. The primary risk factors are going to be include the occurrence of secondary pneumothoraxes and a history of COPD in 67% of all cases. <laughs> Uh, Seventy-five percent of all um, um, idiotrigic, um pneumothoraxes occur in the hospital, associated with a needle aspiration, biopsies, catheterization, and subclavian um, cannulation attempts. Pathophysiology is going to have is going to be a spontaneous pneumothorax um, occurs without a prior event or another apparent cause. A primary pneumothorax is going to be one that occurs with patients without underlying pulmonary diseases, and also secondary pneumothorax is going to be one that has underlying diseases process like COPD, asthma, uh, cystic fibrosis, pneumonia, um, interstitial lung diseases. Uh, Granule mo granulomus um, lung disease, rupture of the subpleural blebs um, is going to be a common cause. All right, so cystic fibrosis. This is going to be a hereditary disease also affecting the sweat glands, pancreas, liver, and intestines. Congestive, or so CHF, C CF. Our CF is, uh, so cystic fibrosis is one of the most common um, life-shortening genetic diseases. Uh, pathophysiology, repeated, uh, repeated uh, lung infections caused by scarring of the lung tissue coupled with um, thick mucus secretion cause a progressive increases in pulmonary function. Diseases has no cure and many people die from pulmonary complications in their 20s and 30s. Pneumonia. This is going to be the seventh leading causes of death in the U.S. Uh, Incidences commonly acquire pneumonia. A community acquired pneumonia ranges between range from four to five million cases per year, resulting in one million hospitalizations. Nucocomial um, acquire, or a hospital required pneumonia is going to occur in 250,000 to 300,000 cases per year. And um, if left untreated, it has a mortality rate of 30%, which, which drops 5% if uh, to, 
to, it drops to 5% if treated. Males have a higher incidence of infection and the geriatric population has the increased risk of mortality of 40%, which is the fifth leading cause of um, geriatric death. Uh, pneumonia occurs at the rate of nine cases per minute. Pneumonia is, a, is an infection of the alveoli respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar ducts caused by bacteria, viruses, um, protozoas, and rixetas. Uh, Streptococcus um, caused up to 70% of all cases in the bacteria pneumonia. T um, atypical agents may include uh, legional, uh, legionnaires, um, chlamydia, and also SARS. Uh, uh, so the pathophysiology is going to be that the inflammation, productive cough, fever, pain, dyspnea, blood tinge, sputum, weakness, um, anorexia, weight loss um, may be present in severe cases, tachycardia, uh, tachnea, tachycardia, hypotension may be present and are ominous signs of impending respiratory failure. Pneumonia is one of the leading causes of uh, sepsis in the elderly. Uh, so pertussis. Pertussis is a high, con highly contagious childhood bacterial disease that is uh, prevalent with a vaccine, or that is preventable with a vaccine. It occurs at a rate of 3.3 cases per year for every 100,000 people. In children under the age of one, the ages, uh, uh, age, the incidence of um, is high at 55.2 per every 100,000 people. Uh, so the pathophysiology behind it is that it's also known as a whooping cough and is characterized by a, the para the, the paras paroxysis of coughing due to bacterial infection in the upper airway. The young a, the younger the patient, the worse the symptoms. Complications include pneumonia, dehydration, seizures, brain injuries, ear infections, and also even death. Most deaths occur to younger children who have not been immunized or haven't completed the vaccination series and are exposed to these diseases. All right. Here's our little break. I'm going to take a 10 minute break. So it is now 2.15. We will be back at 2.25. So, all right, we're going to be talking about what are we going to talk about? Basic and advanced invasive airway management. <clears throat> so the quality of the airway assessment allows you to recognize the problem and uses that information in the decision-making process of selecting a right tool, um, tool under the circumstances to achieve respiratory sufficiency. So there's going to be three goals we're going to need to cover. We're going to talk about securing and protecting the airway. We're going to be talking about oxygenating the patient and ventilating the patient. Remember that oxygen, oxygenation and ventilation are two separate things. So uh, frequently based, um, frequ frequently basic airway interventions are most appropriate for um, to open up the airway positioning and suctioning basic airway adjuncts. So we need to throw, we need to look at several things. We need to look at short term versus long term management and must be considered. And is the patient too exhausted to breathe? Will they be going on a ventilator? And also consider that the nature of the disorder, and it will be the uh, will they get worse? Considered an airway burn or toxic inhalation. Once the airway is open, you must ventilate. A minimum of the BVM is essential. Two goals are are important, which is going to be oxygenation and improving ventilation. This um, may be done by involved by ventilating the patient with the BVA with BVM and adding supplemental oxygen or um, interposing um, ventilations with a patient who has a respiratory who is in respiratory distress. Um, a patient is compens um, patient is compensating for respiratory challenge challenge, and at least so far that the compensation might be somewhat successful. All right, so the uses of oxygen has changed over the years. 
Um, remember, we used to be uh, we used to be told that there's no such thing as too much oxygen. Now they're sitting there saying that there is a such thing as giving too much oxygen. Um, so if a patient's O2 sets remain above 100% for too long, what happens is the body starts to shunt. Whenever the body starts to shunt, what it does is it constricts the vessels to because of the fact that the body doesn't need oxygen at general location. So I've actually seen um, – it was actually pretty interesting. It was a um, – a, um, they did a x-ray with the dye of a heart without oxygen, and they put the patient on high flow oxygen for I think it was like an hour or something like that, and then they did the x-ray again. The vessels of the heart basically shrunk in half. So therefore, it reduced the amount of blood flow to the heart because of the fact that it didn't need that much oxygen. So whenever you – stuff like this happens, um, with that vessel shrinking in half, it could actually make a heart attack worse. Um, it could also cause the release of free radicals to uh, – that can cause all kinds of other issues. So a hypoxic uh, patient needs oxygen, but it, but continues. But if you continue high flow oxygen beyond the normal O2 saturation, which is above or basically anything above 95, it may cause a condition called hy hyperoxia. Um, this is usually a cause of systemic vasoconstriction and releases free radicals into the bloodstream, which uh, which is cardiotoxic. Um, in, some, in one study, a COPD patient wa were divided into two groups. One administered oxygen between 10 to, or 8 to 10 liters per minute, and the second group administered oxygen titrated effect to keep their O2 sats at 88 to 92 percent. The titrated group had a lower mortality rate. Oxygen administration should be titrated to um, between 94 to 95 percent. Review your local protocols. Uh, traumatic uh, remember, traumatic brain injury um, injuries, multiple intubation attempts can lead to hypoxemia, which leads to poor outcome. Pediatrics at short-term setting uses um, use of a BVM with supplemental oxygen has the same outcome as an in versus intubation. Positive pressure ventilation is the most important tool, but is also some um, has some downsides. So the heart uses the negative pressure of breathing to assist with filling, which is the um, which is loss where when the use of positive ventilation is is implemented. Um, this can drop cardiac output, minimize the effects of, by only providing enough pressure to cause chest rise. Remember, hyperventilation kills your patient. What it does is it helps um, – it actually causes a constriction of the, of the aorta and can also increase or decrease preload of the heart. So, so removal of too much CO2 can cause a, a cerebral vasoconstriction and reduce the amount of blood flow to the brain. You want to only ventilate at no more than two, 20 breaths per minute. All right, so – Advanced Airway Applications Using the CPAP. So the CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It is, um, must be used on a breathing patient. It creates a higher flow of mixing O2 and room air. Commonly uses um, to treat um, acute um, pulmonary edema. Can also decrease cardiac port load. <laughs> um, it is designed to provide positive and expiratory pressure, um, which prevents um, – Tachylitis can also decrease cardiac output due to positive pressure. Never use a CPAP on a hypotensive patient. Um, advanced airway applications, um, ATV or otherwise known as an automatic transport ventilators. So a this is usually a compact ventilator which comes in two or three controls. Um, one will, will control rate. Another one will control tidal volume. They can be used with a 15 and a 20 millimeter adapter for ET tubes and other airway devices. Some only deliver control mechanical ventilations in patients who are not breathing. Others may also will function as an intermittent a mandatory ventilations. Tidal volumes in most of, uh, is mostly adjustable, while the rate is usually at, at a fix or, a, or it could be adjustable also. O2 concentration is usually set at 100%, but also may be adjustable. Some ventilators do have the ability to blend 
uh, pure oxygen with room air. Uh, many of them do have pop-off valves to prevent pressure related injuries, which um, can hinder ventilating pressure with um, cardiogenic PEs, ARDS, pulmonary contusions, and bronchospasms. Other conditions have a high um, have can have can uh, other conditions with high airway pressures. Most of them have no alarms for tube displacement or barotrauma, um, not to be used in children under the age of five, and not to be used with on awake patient. Uh, do not use the patient with uh, with an obstructed airway or increased respiratory resistance. When performing. Uh, applications using intratracheal intubation, or otherwise known as ETI. When performed correctly, an intratracheal intubation um, represents the highest level of pre-hospital airway management. There is no airway um, which is more secured. The intratracheal intubation is controversial and it does carry many risks. You can accidentally, um, you can accidentally Intubate the esophagus versus the trachea, and it can go undetected if, if you do not properly do your assessment after intubation. You can accidentally um, perforate the tracheal wall, or you can or esophageal wall. You can also accidentally um, uh, damage the vocal cords while, while intubating. So it says here pre-hospital success rates are between 60 to 90 percent. This a lot of times has to do with the amount of practice that you do outside of the of um, during training. So when you consider the potential um, da disastrous um, complications, um, a successful rate of less than 100% is unacceptable. Uh, com um, complications are going to be death due to ad um, adverent intubation or esophagus of the esophagus, hypoxia, uh, hypoxia increased intracranial pressure, or, and also trauma. Uh, poor initial training, or sorry, sorry, low success rate is going to be due to poor initial training, infrequent use of the procedure non-existent training um, opportunities, and also very little chances of these conditions improving. Um, or where their paramedics obtain their initial training are used to be uh, used to be blind inserts. Devices are more frequently because of short-term um, anesthesia, liability issues, and complications uh, from other health care professionals which limit paramedics participation. Many of these devices cannot be uh, provide paramedic uh, cannot cannot provide the paramedic with the superior uh, potency of the um, intratracheal or patency of an intratracheal intubation. All right, so remember, intubation is a technical skill which will degrade over time. With success rates being um, in question, the rates must improve for the skill to be continued. Desperate situations for this innovation is absolutely necessary, and it will not go away. Uh, there are three major things to consider to uh, in preserving innovation as a skill in the paramedics. For one, admit that there is a problem. Uh, and then two, select the situation in which the innovation is necessary and airway al um, as airway alternatives. And then also three, concentrate on confirming to placement. If we wish, wish to move forward, we must um, have a major concern and safety of our patients. Uh, so first off, what we need to do is we need to select appropriate size. Not all patients need the airway and, um, or needs to be intubated, and it should also be performed only to those patients who will gain the greatest benefit. Improving confirmation of the two uh, position technology, use waveform capnography. That's going to be your uh, one of your best way. You also have your colorimetric paper. You have other things like the bulbs. Um, there are several different ways we could uh, L moisture or condensation on the tube. Uh, chest rise and fall. These are all good indicators. To let you know if you are if you are getting good um, if you if your intubation is successful. ETCO2 detectors are very inexpensive and can be proven to be de uh, can detect one percent of the displaced tubes. 
So primary com confirmation should be you should be listening for um, auscultate over the epigastrum, mid axillary region, um, anterior chest um, on the right side and left side. Secure the tube. Makes note that the tubes marked in front of the patient's teeth, and we also reconfirm it as um, as often as possible. Uh, secondary confirmation: you could use ETCO2 waveform cat capnography. Uh, if the tube is found to be displaced, remove and reventilate the patient. Reperform intubation. Uh, nasal tracheal intubation. So slightly more. Com uh, this is going to be slightly more uh, complex. Uh, then an oral um, tracheal intubation. Patients must be spontaneous, have, may, must have spontaneous respirations, but both need um, airway isolation. Uh, these are usually ideal for patients that have overdosed, asthma, um, anaphylaxis, COPD, stroke, um, and also acute my, uh, so ultimate status. Uh, complications. So you got epistaxis or nosebleeds. Uh, vagal stimulation, respiratory, uh, or injury to the turbinates uh, or nasal um, septum, vocal cord injury, retropharyngeal injuries, esophageal intubation, tracheal intubation, insertion uh, if the patient um, has a crib form skull fracture. So here's a uh, illustration of a crib, uh, a crib form skull, um, skull fracture. As you see here, the thin bone at the top of the that's on top of the of the um, the pharyngeal, uh, or sorry, the 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 pharynx is fractured and it gives it direct access to the brain. So whenever you go to advance that ET tube, it can accidentally go into that, um, follow that. Um, fracture and accidentally perforate the the lining of the brain and cause all kinds of other issues. All right, so pediatric intubation special considerations. So you need to know what um, what makes them different. The upper airway is a lot smaller. The tongue is larger. The epiglottis is a omega shape versus a leaf shape, and it is also um, narrower and longer. Um, in the first few months of life, the cords slope to the back, uh, back to front. The ET tube um, can get hung up in the angle formed by the cords, uh, which a general sulex mover will help alleviate that. Uh, cricord, um, cartilage is the narrowest point of the airway. The distance from the cords to the carina is only two to two and a half inches. And the newborn um, in the newborns in three to three and a half inches in the six years of age. When intubating, um, take care not to place the tube in the right main stem of the bronchus. Use the cuffed uh, ET tube for children over the age of eight. All right, so the um, blind airway insertion or blind insertion airway devices. These are usually designed often to simple, um, simple alternatives uh, to endotracheal intubation and provide a level of protection against aspiration by, at least in theory, isolating the glottic openings. Uh, they require a limited training and do not interrupt with these with chest compressions during CPR. Not only um, are they appropriate to superior uh, alternative to um, alternative to eat, um, intratracheal intubation, they do not isolate the trachea and should not be used um, in situations such as airway burns, um, laryngeal edema, and also epiglottitis. So there's going to be two, um, there's going to be two different categories. We've got your um, um, esophageal um, Burgerators, and we also have your supra epiglottic devices. So the uh, esophageal um, burators uh, is going to be most common. It's going to be your combi tube and your King LT. The way these work is you're going to insert it, um, which uh, with the head in the neutral position, to a um, to a certain depth on the patient's size. When both balloons are inflated, the only inflate um, only in, the only inf available opening is going to be the epiglottic opening. 
Um, these type of devices come in different sizes. The dual lumen airways can't be used in children. The King LT also um, has a minimum size. Patients cannot have esophageal diseases, esophageal bleeding, or have ingested of a poisonous substance. Uh, the devices can dislodge during the patient's movement. All right, so the super, so the super epiglottic airways, these are things where we like the um, LMA and also, uh, what's that new one that came out, the eye gels? Oh, I had a message. Um, all right, about the quizzes, I was sitting there thinking about it. There may not be quizzes for the um, paramedic refresher. I may be just thinking about the EMT refresher. Sorry about that false information. I started to think about it roughly during my last, uh, during lunch break. So um, I don't, uh, so I'm gonna have to retract that statement. I don't think there is no quizzes for when it comes to um, the paramedic refresher. So I think the only thing y'all gotta do, um, go on the website and look, there may be a homework. I cannot remember, I, there, but there's something that's different. I think um, I think y'all just have to take a, um, oh, a, uh, I think y'all gotta take a homework exam right before, uh, right before you take your final, I think. I will, um, yeah, let me text my boss real quick and I'll find out. Um, and I'll have an answer within a few minutes. Let me give him a second to comment back and uh, I will know for sure. I haven't, um, I've done the, I've done the paramedic refresher once, but that was like, it's been a few years ago before, I, since I've done it. So I don't remember what my requirements are, but I do not remember having to take any kind of homework quizzes or anything else like that. But we've also redesigned the system since I've taken it too. So, um, I will find out some more here in just a few minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep on going. Division quizzes on the website, okay. So there is some kind of quizzes. Um, I think those are, I think if I remember correctly, when it comes to uh, the EMT, those are not required for them to take it, but they can take them if they want to. But the paramedic, it is required for y'all to take them. If I remember, if I remember correctly, correctly. All right. Okay, I want to go ahead and keep on going while I'm waiting for an answer. All right, so uh, all right, so I was talking about LMAs. Um, LMAs, uh, the other one that's going to that's that's kind of phasing out the LMAs is now the eye gels. They look exactly like an EMA, LMA. It's just they have, uh, instead of causing, um, they're, they're more of a, a conforming gel versus an actual air pressure. All right, so the LMA is the most common superglottic airway. They uh, work by creating a seal around the glottic opening. And there's my answer. All right, so here, he, this is what he told me. I uh, said, oh yeah, there's all on their EMS accounts. They need to log in and get it done. Um, they can call customer service if they need to set up or have questions. They do have a final exam to do. Okay, so that's it. You got your homework quizzes um, to do and also you got your final exam to do. So you do have unit or uh, division quizzes you have to do to um, complete everything. Um, and that's on your your, your account through emsuniversity.com backslash EMS.
Um, and of course, if y'all need to set up an account still, you can call customer service and they can get you set up if you haven't done so already. Sometimes whenever the, they send out the um, email to instructions on how to set it up, it goes to people's junk mail, their spam mail. So that's where they, you have to a lot of times find it at. But I, I'm assuming if you if you are here, you found you probably found those emails. All right. So the glottic opening um, it reasonably protects the um, airway from secretions. It can dislodge when um, and subjected to high airway pressure. Patient movement um, can dislodge the LMA. Oh come on. All right, so the disadvantages to these type of airways, uh, which is going to be, you must, you must be, um, the patient must be unresponsive with no gag reflex. Uh, patient must adequately ventilate prior to the insertion, and airway must be removed if the patient regains consciousness. The airway should be replaced with an endotracheal intubation as, uh, intubation as soon as possible. Trachea cannot be suctioned with this airway in place. All right, let me see where I had to. All right, so we only got a little bit more of airway, then we can start car cardiology. The cardiology part is actually most of it, like I said earlier, it's going to be um, EKG rhythms. So let me get back into presentation mode. All right, so we're going to start talking about the cricheotomy and rapid sequence intubation or induction. Um, so there is two different types of, of needle cricotomy, um, which we have the needle, which is going to be a translaryngeal cannula ventilation, and also open cricotomy. The needle cricotomy is easier to perform, but uh, but providing adequate ventilation is more difficult. Uh, surgical cricotomy is the more difficult, but allows for more effective ventilation, uh, oxygenation, and ventilation. Um, Uh, so where is it? Okay, so needle or trans the trans laryngeal cannula ventilation or open. Uh, so when extreme circumstances prevent the placement of the of an intratracheal tube or a, or a um, BIAD device, a surgical airway may be the only way to ensure your patient's survival. Prior to doing a surgical airway, you must sh you should have exhausted all other options prior to that. This right here guy would be a good example. Blown off his face with a shotgun. Um, and as you can see here, his airway's compromised. He's bleeding into his airway, so he actually needs a trach. Uh, here's another one. This one right here looks like to be burns from a, um, or from a, from a, some kind of uh, chemical. All right, so te uh, technically, this is easier to open up a cricheotomy and, um, and has a lower complication rate, but it can be, um, this can be rapidly performed. It does not manipulate the C-spine, provides adequate ventilation when performed properly. Um, this usually does not interfere with endo endo endotracheal intubation attempts. Oh, this is just a needle cricheotomy. Um, does not perform um, interfere with intratracheal attempts. Must followed with a larger diameter um, definitive airway, like a yeah, like an intratracheal intubation or a surgical cricheotomy. A lot of times, whenever you're doing needle cricheotomies, this is temporary. You're just trying to get some air in. Um, this does not um, prevent aspirations and requires oxygenation with um, a trans trans. A trans tracheal high pressure jet ventilator and does not indicate that if um, the, um, if the patient cannot exhale or or high pressure ventilation um, equipment is not available um, this can cause barrel trauma for if you over inflate the lungs you do have to allow excessive um, you do have to allow extra time for passive um, uh, passive ventilation or, um, or expiration is what I meant to say. 
um, has excessive bleeding due to the improper catheter, catheter placement, um, can cause subcutaneous emphysema from improper placement of the subcutaneous placement um, into the subcutaneous tissue. You can have excessive air leak into the cat, uh, from the catheter. Uh, other complications are going to be laryngeal trauma, airway obstructions um, from the compression of the tracheal, trachea secondary to bleeding or subcutaneous air. You can also have um, hypoventilation from the use of improper equipment or misplacement of the catheter. All right, so the surgical cricheotomy. This is going to be the cut and poke uh, portion of this. So this is going to be your absolute last, re last resort when all other attempts to, uh, to secure the airway has failed. This is associated with a high degree of, of complications. The surgical airway involves a direct, um, directing the ET tube into the airway through a surgical incision of the, um, of the cricoid membrane, or sorry, cr cricothyroid membrane. This can be rapidly performed and does not involve movement of the C-spine. Contraindications are going to be the same as a needle cricheotomy, not to be performed in children under the age of 12. All right, so uh, there, these complications are associated only to surgical. You're going to have incorrect tube placement in false passages, cricoid or thyroid damage, severe bleeding, laryngeal nerve damage, Subcutaneous emphysema, vocal cord injury, infection. Uh, what you need to do is you need to locate the thyroid and the, and the cricoid cartilage and locate the thyrocarcrate membrane between the two. Clean the area with an antiseptic solution if you have time. Um, have your partner set up section SpO2 and EKG. What you need to do is you need to stabilize the cartilage with your hand using, using a scalpel in, um, in the other hand to make a one to two centimeter vertical incision over the membrane. Find the cricoid membrane again and make a one centimeter incision over um, in the um, horizontal plane through the membrane, avoiding the nearby veins and arteries. All right. Okay. All right. So, and then you're going to insert an in ET tube. Um, you're going to first insert a, a curved hemostatic um, a hemostats into the membrane incision to spread it open. So you're going to try to minimize the damage to the surrounding structures by using blunt object to open it up. You can also use the back of the scalpel to puncture it and also kind of move it back and forth um, to open it up wider. And, a, and then use a, a 6 to 7.0 cuffed ET tube. You can actually uh, do a little cheater too, since the ET tube's so long. You can actually cut it right above where the um, the balloon connects to the ET tube, so you can shorten the the length of the tube. Um, insert the tube into the trachea, inflate the cuff, um, confirm placement with the with auscultation etco2 and adequate chest rise secure the tube in place um, so rsi medication so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with your induction agency and agent um, used to provide sedation prior to para, um, paralytics um, patients must receive sedation prior to blocking agent um, so you want a pre-medicate agent with given to a certain patient prior to blocking agent. You got several different kinds. You got uh, drugs like um, propofol, you have your Versed's, all your, all your benzos that will work. Pre-medicate pre with those. Get the patient nice and, um, nice and knocked out. Um, Pre-medicate, um, and then you want to give a give some some of the blunt um, adverse side effects uh, to the blocking agent. You want to do a neuromuscular blocking agent um, are given to provide complete muscular relaxation and facilitate intubation. My my personal preference is I like to give a drug like succocholine first, or so you're going to give up. You'll give your your drug like I said. Then you're going to go ahead and give something like succocholine. So just in case you do not get that um, get that intubation, you can actually um, won't have to worry about longer, longer effects like 
um, like you get with rocaronium or, or vecaronium. And then from there, um, after you get a, a, a good innovation or you, you're, you're, you're um, successful, then you can look at adding a, a longer agent like um, succicol. No, not succicolin, sorry. <coughs> rocaronium or maybe even some propofol. Um, blocking agents are usually cho um, chosen from their onset of actions and duration of effects. The NMBAs are, are medications that result in the chemical per, um, paralysis of the skeletal muscles. Uh, patients cannot move, breathe, or even speak. So NMBAs do not provide sedation. Patient is awake at all times under that anesthesia. Um, anesthesia patients can feel the pain. And then the amnesia patients will remember everything. Or to do, um, so the um, anesthesia, so they, they will feel the pain and also they will not, they will remember everything going on. So the, um, the NMBAs should always be used in conjunction with a sedative induction agent. <clears throat> so in, in indications for RSI, this is gonna be inducing temporary paralysis to facilitate endotracheal intubation. Pending respiratory failure due to COPD, CHF, asthma, or pneumonia. Acute airway disorders that um, threaten airway, respiratory burns, inhalation injuries, upper airway um, and trauma, and also epiglottitis. Uh, you have altered middle status with significant um, risks of aspiration as, um, as in head trauma. If they have a GCS less than eight, um, the role is you know, a GCS less than eight intubate drugs or alcohol ingestion, um, and also status elepticus. So here's some of our drugs. You got your induction agent, which this is gonna be a, um, a barbiturous and hypotonics. Uh, we have the um, penotol. Uh, this is gonna be a acting barbiturate. Um, onset's gonna be between 10 to 20 seconds. Duration's gonna be about five to 10 minutes. So pretty short acting. Uh, doses are between two to five milligrams per kilogram IV. We have Brevital. This is gonna be extremely short acting, a barbiturate. Usually a quick onset of um, less than a minute duration is gonna be between five, five to seven minutes and the doses between one to 20, I'm sorry, one to two micrograms per kilogram IV. Amidate, or otherwise known as Tomidate. Uh, this is a short acting non pabrituate hypotonic agent. Um, this is very safe. Usually the onset's gonna be between 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, duration's gonna be five, uh, three to five minutes. Doses could be between, between 0.2 to 0.3 milligram per kilogram over 15 to 30 seconds. Um, Dripavin, or otherwise known as propofol, this is an extremely short-acting um, sedative caused by, and can cause apnea very quickly. The onset is between 10 to 20 seconds. Duration is going to be 10 to 15 minutes. The dose is between 1 to 3 milligram per kilogram. Um, fentanyl. Fentanyl is usually a short-acting um, opiate, uh, referred to as some patients are, sorry, Preferred to use for patients with kidney diseases. Onsets could be between 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, oh, sorry, no, duration is going to be 30 to 60 minutes. And doses could be in between 2 to 10 micrograms per kilogram. Morphine. Morphine is less effective than fentanyl. Um, it does have some um, contraindicated uh, with patients with kidney diseases or compromises. The onset is going to be between three to five minutes. Duration is going to be two to seven hours. Uh, Dose is going to be between 1.1 uh, to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. Ketamine. Ketamine is a awesome dissociative drug that is used in general anesthesia. May increase ICP levels. Um, onsets. Um, is less than one minute duration. Um, it's going to be between 10 to 20 minutes, and the dose is going to be between one to four milligrams per kilogram. Um, and that is IV. So benzodiazepines um, are we're going to have here is we're going to have um, Versed, or otherwise known as midazolam. 
This is a very potent benzodiazepine, moderate and long lasting, uh, two to four times more potent in Valium. The onset is going to be is, is a one to two minutes. Duration is going to be 30 to 60 seconds. Dose is going to be between 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Can be administered IM also and also intranasal if, um, if you're needing it for, um, for other reasons. But if you, um, the ideal preferred is going to be IV because the, with the IM injection, it's going to be a slower absorption rate. Oh, man. All right, so Valium. Valium is another benzodiazepine. Can be used for um, can cause hypotension. Uh, onset is going to be between two to four minutes. Uh, durations are between thirty to ninety minutes. Dose is going to be 0.25 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. IV. Ativan. This is not typically routinely used for RSI. It does have a an um, onset action um, that is just way too long. This is more of a uh, Ativan is more of a long term versus short term because of the fact that if a, a lot your a lot of your benzos the quicker onset it does the the more potent it is but if it has a if it takes longer to take effect it's more likely going to be designed to go um, to be activated or be um, in the system for a long period of time. Uh, lidocaine. You can use this to help um, control ICPs in the head during a possible cardiac dysrhythmias um, or, and possible cardiac dysrhythmias. Dose between 0.0 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV push given every two to three minutes prior to innovation. Atropine can be used in adults exhibiting signs of bradycardia or at risk of developing bradycardia. Administer um, to all pediatric patients less than three years of age if you're having to intubate them. Dose is going to be 0.5 milligrams IV push. Uh, pediatric doses, or the adult dose, um, pediatric doses will be 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram IV push. All right, so the Vecaronium. Vecaronium is a small dose. I would say a small dose of Vecaronium may, be, may ease um, 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 fasciculations and possibly uh, possible injuries from the depolarization effects of succicoline. Adult doses for children are going to be greater than three. It's going to be 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram IV push. All right, so... Uh, succicoline. This is going to be a depolarizing neuro neuromuscular blocking agent. Onsets could be between 60 to 90 seconds. Duration is going to be three to five minutes. Uh, priming doses is going to be one milligram per kilogram. Um, pancuronium, which is going to be a long-acting non-depolarizing um, agent, is going to be between 30 to 45 seconds of onset, and duration is going to be between 30 to 60 minutes. Dose is between 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram IV push. Um, um, norcoronium or vecaronium, vecaronium, this is a non-polarizing blocker with rapid onset and short duration. Doses causes fasciculations. Uh, um, the dose is going to be 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram IV. Um, Tracheronium, trachium, or atacaronium, which is a non-polarizing blocking agent with rapid onset and short intermediate duration. I do not have doses or onset here. Um, all right, well that's the end of airway.